off a brand new series. It's a four-week series that I'm really stoked about called Greater Than. And over the next few weeks, you're going to hear and see and uh, experience some things here at Connect Church we've not done before. Some special effects things. Uh, you know, that, you notice they've got the screens moved this past week. We're having a little trouble getting the uh, projectors adjusted. We'll have that fixed by next week. We'll have the speakers hung by next week. Keep in mind, this is a work in progress. We greatly appreciate your patience and understanding as we continue to make a little more progress each week. A little girl was sitting at her kitchen table furiously working away on her sketch pad. She had her crayons, and she had her magic markers, and she had her colored pencils, and she was very, very intent on what she was doing. And as her mother walked by, she said, Honey, what are you doing? The little girl looked at her mom, and she said, Mommy, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, Mom got a little nervous for just a moment. And she said, Honey, you can't draw a picture of God because no one knows what God looks like. She said, they will now. <laughs> if someone asked you to describe God, what words would you use? I mean, how big is God? How wise is God? How powerful is God? How loving is God? How awesome is God? People talk about God all the time. I hear His name used in a variety of ways almost every day. I mean, who really is God? How great is God? As we kick off this series this morning, I want to make a disclaimer to you. There are many, many things I don't understand or comprehend about God. Aren't you glad you came today? Amen. Got out of bed early to hear a Amen. guy talk about a God he doesn't really know. Yep. Amen. <laughs> Just being honest with you people. Let me give you an example. I don't understand the eternal nature of God. If you're following along in your notes there in the middle of your worship folder, the psalmist said these words. He said, before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. I can't really understand that. No beginning, no end. I mean, your life... And my life had a beginning. There was a time on this planet when there was no such being as David Harris. I'm told it was a much calmer time. <laughs> there was also never supposed to be a David Harris. My mother had some rare birth defects and it was uh, advised by her physicians that she never have children. She didn't listen to her physicians. And when her water broke prematurely, Toxic poison shot through, through her entire system. The doctor said, I'm not supposed to be here. And yet here I stand. I have a beginning and I will have an end. But the Bible is very clear. It says God never had a beginning. It says God is from everlasting to everlasting. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think about a life that has no end, when I think about eternity, it goes on and on and on. It kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. It freaks me out just a little bit. And then to think that this life that has no end never even had a beginning. Many scientists would tell us that the origin of the earth started with a big bang. I don't really have a problem with a big bang that initiated everything. But my question to them is, well, where did the matter and the energy and the gases come from that led to that so-called Big Bang? What's the explanation for original cause? The only explanation that satisfies the problem of original cause is that there is a God who has always been, who is eternal, and He has always existed. Amen. And the other thing I understand about God is this mystery of the thing we call the Trinity. Many of you are familiar with that concept. If you've ever attended a baptism, you hear somebody like me say, Now I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you remember that old hymn that says, Holy, 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 God in three persons, blessed. Amen. Or maybe church is new to you and you just remember that old Don McLean song, American Pie. 
the three men I admire most, the Father, Son, and the Holy. They took the last train for the coast. The day, the music. The Everybody now. Bye bye, bye. Mr. American Pie. Throw my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was through. I say now. Good old There's some old people here today. <laughs> knowledge of the concept of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Bible teaches very, very clearly that the Father is God and that Jesus the Son is God and that the Holy Spirit of God and there is only one God. I don't get it. People have tried to explain it with analogies. I've heard people say, well, God is like water. Water can be in a liquid form. It can be in the form of ice or it can be in the form of Steam. Or I've heard people say, well, God is like the egg. You have the shell, and you have the yolk, and you've got that white stuff. <laughs> or God's like Neapolitan ice cream. It's all ice cream, it's all good, it's one scoop, it has chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Folks, I'm not going to try and reduce God who is all-knowing and all-powerful and everywhere in the universe at once with some silly analogy like Neapolitan ice cream. Let's just call it like it is. The God of all creation is greater than anything and everything that we can ever begin to describe or comprehend. And no words can explain the totality of God. He is more awesome than you and I will ever begin to imagine. I don't understand the eternal nature of God. And I don't understand the mystery of the Trinity. But even more than that, I don't understand why He's so interested in me. I grew up in a Christian home. I've known Jesus personally since I was four years old. I've known Him essentially all my life. And even when I'd say and do dumb things, even when I made bad choices, God was always there. When life got tough, God was always there. When circumstances were greater than I could, could uh, care for, God was there. When circumstances were beyond my control, God was there. But several years ago, going through one of the darkest times of my life, my then wife walked out of me. She said, I'm sick of church, I'm sick of ministry, and I'm sick of you. She never returned. I was trying to deal with the pain and the betrayal, and I found myself facing things about marriage and about life and about myself, some of which I didn't really like. I was trying to deal with that sense of failure and all of those unanswered questions and whatever realm of regret got tossed around in my brain. And on top of that, I was a pastor. Pastoring, ministry, preaching was my life's call and calling, but it was also my livelihood. And I couldn't imagine anybody would ever want a pastor who had a failed marriage on his record. I thought that I'd lost everything. And I sincerely wondered if God could make a way for David Harris. And yet, it's in light of that time, not in spite of that time, that I can stand here this morning and tell anybody who will listen to me that God is greater than my circumstances. That God is greater than your circumstances. But if I'm going to be honest, I still don't understand why the God of all creation is interested in David Harris. Some of you sitting in this room this morning are caught up in circumstances that are big and overwhelming. And you're wondering if the God of the universe is greater than your circumstances. Is he greater than the fears you have right now? Is He greater than the wounds and the hurts that you're carrying? Is He greater than your past? Is He greater than your failures? Is He greater than your regrets? And if He is, can God of the universe make a way in this world for your life? That's the question I'm wrestling with. That's the question we're going to wrestle with throughout this entire four-week series. But in the time that we have left this morning, and that's about three hours, <laughs> I want to give you some thoughts about God. If you're following along in your outline, there's a kind of a, a phrase there that says, God 
who makes a way when there seems to be no way. And then there's a verse that's found in Psalm 147. I want to ask you to read it with me. Be ready on the count of three. One, two, three. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond measure. Who can know the Lord's ways? Now considering that, some of you are wondering today if God is even aware of your circumstances. And so my first consideration for you this morning there, thought number one is this. God knows my circumstances. His understanding is beyond comprehension. <clears throat> Think about it. God has perfect knowledge of all things. You can't throw a surprise party for God. <laughs> and God doesn't have to remember things because God never forgets anything. <laughs> and God doesn't have to project into the future because God knows the future. And no matter how much knowledge we gain, we will never know more than God. God has complete comprehension of all things. God has complete comprehension of geology and zoology and biology and meteorology and kinesiology and anthropology and sociology and psychology and theology and for you barbers out there, cosmetology. <laughs> In Isaiah chapter 55, here's what the writer says. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Now here's the questions people sometimes ask me. Maybe it's a question that you've thought of. Maybe it's even something that passed through your mind earlier this week. How much higher? I mean, what's the distance between your wisdom and God's wisdom? It says, as the heavens are higher than the earth. Well, how high is that? years ago, an author by the name of Mark Batterson wrote a book called The Circle Maker. In that book, he talked about how high the heavens are. He says that the universe is so large that it requires quite a long measuring tape. In fact, the, the basic unit of measurement in the universe is what we call a light year. Add that to the list of something else I don't understand this morning. Light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. In the time it takes you to snap your fingers, light goes around the earth six times. As a matter of fact, I want you to capture that. So on a count of three, I want you to hold your hands up like this. On a count of three, I want everybody to snap your fingers. One, two, three. Light went around the earth six times while we did that. Are you beginning to get why well, I don't understand this? Now, you and I live in this neighborhood called the Milky Way. And there are billions of stars in this gateway. But here's the thing. It's not the only one. Science estimates that there are over 80 million more galaxies. Not stars. Galaxies. So if you're following along in your outline, catch this. In one minute, light travels 11 million miles. In one day, light travels 16 billion miles. In one year, light travels 5,865,696 miles. Folks, we're talking U.S. national debt levels now. <laughs> and folks, that's just one light year. According to astrophysicists, the outer end of the universe is 15.5 billion light years away. Now, that's pretty much unimaginable, right? And God says that that's the distance between His thoughts and your thoughts. That means on your best day, your best thought is 15.5 billion light years short of how great and wise God is. God's thoughts are 15.5 billion light years higher than your thoughts. But here's the absolute coolest thing about this. And it's also the most important thing. God knows your circumstances. He knows your physical circumstances, your emotional circumstances, your relational circumstances, your spiritual circumstances, your financial circumstances. He knows your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups before you even tell him about them. Even though he's 15.5 billion light years 
Ohio. Heard about a wealthy grandfather who was going deaf. And so as he was going deaf, he goes to this doctor to get some new hearing aids. And the doctor says, you'll be able to hear perfectly now. And a one month went by, this very affluent grandfather goes back in for a 30-day checkup. And the doctor says, I bet your family loves your hearing aids. And the old man looked at him and he said, Doc, I haven't even told my family about my hearing aids. I've just been sitting around listening to their conversations. Changed my will four times. <laughs> Sometimes folks, we're like that family, aren't we? We don't think anyone is watching. We don't think anyone is listening. We don't think anyone cares. And our omniscient, all-knowing God knows what we're going through. Psalm chapter 56, verse 8. The psalmist says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And the image that takes place when we read that scripture is that God is so moved by circumstances that you are going through in your life that He numbers and personally collects all your tears in a bottle. Eric Clapton wondered in his Grammy-winning song about the loss of his six-year-old son if there are tears in heaven. And the answer to Eric Clapton and to you, by the way, is yes, there are tears in heaven. The tears that are in heaven are all the tears that you and I have cried here on earth. And God has collected them. And there's a bottle in heaven with my name on it. And there's a bottle in heaven with every one of your names on it. And it means God has entered into our suffering so much so that he understands what each one of those tears represents. You say, well, David, nobody knows the hell I'm going through this morning. Nobody knows what's going through in my home or my life right now. You're wrong. God does. God knows the struggle that you're going through as you're trying to break an addiction or a habit. God knows the depression that you're wrestling with, the fear that is binding you, the brokenness that you can't seem to let go of, the loneliness that is encapsulating you, the hopelessness that is overwhelming you. See, ladies and gentlemen, nothing in my life and nothing here in your life is ever off the record with God. You say, well, David, okay. For the sake of this conversation, I'll accept that God knows my circumstances. But where is He when I'm in a tough spot? Thought number two this morning. God is present in my circumstances. You ever heard someone use the word omnipresent? I was watching the NBA Finals a couple of months ago. And uh, Toronto Raptors, Golden State Warriors, and the Toronto Raptors have this all-star named Kawhi Leonard. And he is an incredible offensive player, and he is an incredible defensive player, and he is an incredible passer and teammate. And the announcers would frequently say throughout the series as he was named MVP, it seems like Ka Kawhi Leonard is everywhere on the court at once. Jeremiah chapter 23 says these words. Am I a God who is only close at hand, says the Lord? No. I am far away at the same time. Can anyone hide from me in a secret place? Am I not everywhere in all the heavens and all the earth, says the Lord? See, God is expressing to us what we call His omnipresence, that He is present everywhere all at once. And as fast and as mobile and as an incredible athlete as Kawhi Leonard is, He can only be in one place at one time. But not God. God is everywhere. God is in the heavens and He's in the earth. He is everywhere present all at the same time. The reality is God's complete essence is fully present in all circumstances at all times. Psalm 139 says these words, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. It means that God is so big that He's everywhere. You say, but well, David, when you say God is everywhere, does that mean that God is kind of like the Spirit that hovers over everything and everywhere, but you only get whatever little piece is hanging on Him? Like, David, if I'm in Australia, and I just get the peace of God that's hovering off over Australia, but over here in Japan, they get a peace of God that is hovering over there, and over here in the Middle East, they get a peace of God, and up in Russia, they get a peace of God, and, and uh, down in 
down in Tucson, they get a little piece of God, and Tucson doesn't get anything, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, folks, that's not what I'm saying at all. It's, you never get just part of God, you always get all of Him. The complete essence is always fully present. And the good news for me and for you is because when I meet Jesus here in Phoenix, I don't want to hear that He's off in Toledo somewhere. If we meet Jesus here in the United States, we don't want to hear that He's hanging out in Southeast Asia this week. It means that whatever circumstance you're in, as you sit here this morning, God is with you. And some of you might be having trouble seeing God because the storm clouds in your life are so thick. You wonder how you can trust that He is there if you can't see Him. Heard about a little boy who was out on the beach flying a kite. It was a pretty ugly day. It was a pretty cloudy day. The clouds were hanging low. And and his kite was up there, and he couldn't really see it. And this lady walked by, and she said, Son, how do you know your kite is up there? And the little boy said, Because I can feel its tug. See, even when you can't see God, when the clouds are too low, and the fog is too thick in your life, you can feel this tug. Sometimes people tell me that they don't feel that their prayers are getting any higher than the ceiling. And my response is, that's okay because your prayers don't have to get any higher than the ceiling because God is there in the room with you. Which leads me to my third thought. God can empower my circumstances. Do you know what a person who checks into rehab has to be able to do? All they have to be able to do is admit they have an issue they are powerless over. That they can't do it on their own strength. That's it. And the thing that's standing in the way of your circumstances right now, or some of you anyway, the thing that's standing in the way between you experiencing God in the midst of your circumstances and you experiencing God's power, is just good old fashioned pride. You think you don't need God and you're doing just fine. You're like the person who jumped off the 100 story building. Halfway down, somebody cried out, How are you doing? He said, So far, so good. <laughs> if you don't think you need God, you just haven't hit bottom yet. Jeremiah hit bottom. He had some overwhelming circumstances going on in his life. And he was supposed to be this mouthpiece, this prophet of God. And, and yet he was kind of uh, being made fun of and ridiculed and even imprisoned and tormented and tortured there in the village square. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, we read these words. O oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And folks, nothing is too hard for God. What's hard is coming to the point where we admit that we need that God. That this God who is greater than. You see, there's a principle at work in our lives when we choose to practice it. It's a principle that says power along the way. That's not in the notes, but somewhere in the margins you may want to write those words. Power along the way. See, we'd all prefer that God would give us His power well in advance of our mitigating circumstances. That we would have power before the crisis hits. Moses kind of wished that. Moses had been obedient to God and, and he had led the children of Israel out of slavery after 400 years of captivity uh, there in Egypt. And as he leads them out, they come up against this barrier called the Red Sea. And when they came to the Red Sea, they checked everybody in the camp, over a million people. They found out they didn't have a single wave runner, they didn't have a single sailboat, and there were no bridges. And then they looked around. And the Egyptian army's bearing down on them. It has the makings of just a good old-fashioned slaughter. And the people began to cry out and panic to Moses. And Moses answered their concerns simply by saying this. I just talked to God and he says that everything's going to be alright. Just keep going. Imagine us going through a difficult time and me coming to you in the midst of a town hall meeting and saying... I just talked to God. It's all cool. Half of you wouldn't be here next week. And Moses says, I just talked to God. And God says, it's going to be all right. All we have to do is step into the water and he'll take care of everything. And the Bible tells us that as Moses stepped into the water, what happens? The water parts. And just as Moses had said from his conversation with God, 
They all walked across on dry gown, ground. Everything was okay. You see how it works? God is more than willing to demonstrate His power in our lives. But He does it step by step, day by day, circumstance by circumstance. And folks, you have no idea how many Sundays here at Connect Church and other places. I'll sit someplace like I do here, just a few feet from coming up to speak. And as I'm sitting down there, listening to the music and engaging myself in the worship, I always take a few minutes to think through about what I'm about to do. And I'm sitting down there, waiting to preach, and this overwhelming sense of inadequacy consumes me. I'll even sit down there sometimes and I'll just think, these people deserve so much more than I have to give them this morning. It happens in other settings. A few years ago, I was invited to speak in San Jose at a conference on preaching. It was a conference given by pastors to pastors. The only problem was, most of the guys who were on there were like a who's who. They pastored large mega churches. They had little radio programs and television programs, and then there was me. And the conference was starting at 9 o'clock, and I got out of my hotel room about 6 o'clock, and I went, and I was sitting in a Starbucks, and I had my prayer journal out, and I was just talking to God. And I found myself saying, God, I'm so inadequate. I'm, I don't deserve the honor of standing up there and sharing what bit I know about how to share you with others in light of what all these other people do and have done and accomplished. And I was writing those words. And I was about three-fourths of the way through one of those woe is me sentences. You know what I'm talking about? And like the Holy Spirit just stopped me. I couldn't write anymore. My hand was locked. And he sat down right beside me. He said, David, don't you get it? I have prepared you your entire life for this moment. I don't want to sound like something I'm not because it's his glory and not mine. But when I had my time to speak at that conference, God showed up and showed himself. Somewhere between that chair and right here, I experienced power along the way. You know what I'm talking about, because maybe you're at odds with, in a relationship or with one of your family members. Maybe you feel powerless. Maybe you don't know what to do or what to say. And the power along the way principle says if you just start walking in the right direction of reconciliation and trust God along the way, Maybe it's at a family dinner and you have to walk toward them. Maybe it's tomorrow morning and you have to walk down the hallway in your office or the classroom in your schoolroom, schoolhouse. But as you walk, as you take that walk, or as you pick up the phone, or as you start moving your lips even, you trust the God who is greater than you to give you power along the way to say what you need to say to the strength to do what you need to do, to say that I'm sorry or to confront if necessary, or the courage to get the issue on the table, God will make a way. Maybe it's a behavior, a lifestyle, a sin pattern, or an addiction. The truth be told, you feel pretty powerless over these days. You've even prayed and asked God to help you. You don't get the sense that He's responding to your prayers. This power along the way principle says, just start walking in the way you feel you need to go. And even if you feel powerless, walk in the direction of a friend. Be honest. And say, here's what's really going on in my life. Some of you here this morning need to go home from this service today. And you need to walk in the direction of what's tripping you up. You need to start cleaning out some of the closets and the cabinets in your life, literally and figuratively. Some of us in this room need to change our address. Some of us in this room need to change some relationships. You say, I don't have the power. You're right, you don't have the power. But as you take steps in the right direction, as you do A, B, and C, that has to be done. God will provide strength along the way. And tonight when you go to bed, you get to lay down with a clear conscience for the first time in a long time. And you can say, thank you, God, for giving me power along the way. Philippians chapter 2, Paul would say these words. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. 
And so those years ago, when I was wondering if God would make a way out of the darkness and out of all the pain that was deeply enveloping me, when I couldn't escape the brokenness and the loneliness, the fear, the isolation, and I felt like my life and my ministry were ruined forever, I wondered if God would ever use me again. I lived. I completely lived in this principle. I was a few weeks into her having walked away. And I walked into the church I was a part of. I was kind of senior staff at a very, very large church in California. And I did something that's not common for me. I walked into our, the first of our two Saturday night services. I came in just about the time it was to start because I didn't really feel like talking to people. Fortunately, I'd only been there a couple weeks. I hadn't yet been up on the big stage. Nobody knew who I was. And at that time, we had bleachers that came out of the back wall. And I climbed to the top of the bleachers as far to the back of the room as you could possibly get. I sat there all by myself. And they were up there singing and talking. I don't know what they were saying. And then, as they were getting ready to take the offering, our worship leader said, Hey, we're going to uh, introduce a new song to you tonight. Now, I didn't want to be there. I was there simply because I was a pastor on staff at that church, and I had to be there. He said, We're going to introduce a new song to you tonight. He said, The title of the song is a new song called Inside Out. And they started playing it, and I started watching the lyrics on the screen. And he said, we're not going to ask you to stand. We just want you to sit and kind of enjoy the song, watch the lyrics. And some of you maybe have heard it or know it, you can sing along, but we're just going to teach it to you tonight. And I'm sitting there in the back row. I'm hearing Jeff sing, and I'm watching the lyrics, and it says, Your will above all else. My purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out. And I just kind of sat there, half watching those and half with my head down, tears soaking my face. And I found myself whispering in that moment of brokenness and loneliness and consumed by the darkness of a pastor going through the divorce he didn't want. Thank God, this sucks. I hurt and I'm scared. I don't know a soul. I've only been here a couple of weeks. I don't even know if they're going to keep me around. God, I gave my life to you when I was four years old. You never promised me a bed of roses. You did promise me you would always be with me. At times carrying me. And God, I don't want this. I don't like this. I don't know what I... It's all I can do to breathe from one minute to the next. But you are God. You are good. And I am yours. I don't have a clue what anybody around me thought. But I can stand here in this moment telling you that story. And it's like I'm reliving it. I can fast forward now. Ten years later. Almost 11, 11 years later. And tell you. That God was present in my circumstances. He gave me just enough strength to breathe the next breath and get up the next morning. Well, things played out. And he was unwavering. And I learned that the God who loves me and the God who lives within me is far greater than any circumstance that has ever surrounded me. This isn't in your worship folder. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I'm going to ask you guys to stand. It's not a trick. How many of you, by show of hands, remember elementary school when they taught you the symbols for like greater than and less than? Remember like the greater than kind of thing? So here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to read a series of scriptures. We're going to be up on the screen. Whenever we get to the highlighted words greater than, I'm just going to do the simple. You can do it with me if you want. It would be like we're back in youth ministry doing motions. But I'm going to do the greater than. Whenever we hit that, I just want you to yell out greater than. And I won't say it. How's that? Let's practice. One, two, three. Greater One, two, three. Greater Let's go to the first one. It says these words. It says, even if we feel guilty, God is our feelings and He knows everything. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my Father has given them to me and He is anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. I know the greatness of the Lord, the psalmist says, that our Lord is any other God. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Because the Spirit who lives in you is than the Spirit who lives in the world. Job said, but you are wrong, and I will show you why. For God is any human being. Isaiah said, how foolish can you be? He is the potter, and he is certainly the clay. John announced, someone is coming soon who is and so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and tie the straps of his sandals. He has come from above, and he is anyone else. He is so much greater than anyone else. And we are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things. But he has come from heaven, and he is anyone else. And this shows that the Son is far, just as the name of God is given him, is greater than the other names. Folks, here's what you've got to understand. God is our circumstances. He is greater than our fears. God is our hurts. He is our past. He is our grief. And God is simply just and so Lord God Almighty. We pause here in this moment to acknowledge that you are the creator of life and the provider of life eternal. We acknowledge, God, that there are things in our lives, circumstances and situations beyond our control. We also acknowledge, God, that there are things in our lives that are our own fault. And we humbly come before you, God, acknowledging that you are the creator of life and you are greater than all of my problems, all of my fears, all of my hurts, all of my past, all of my circumstances. You're greater than my financial issues. You're greater than my spiritual issues. You're greater than my emotional issues. You're greater than my hurts and habits and hang-ups. So God, we give you permission to consume us. We acknowledge you, Lord, that you are love and you are good and you are greater than. Father, we thank you for this room, for this time, for this place, and for this message. We look forward to seeing you next week when we talk about what it means to be greater than our fears. It will be a cool service. Holy Spirit, may we walk out of here appreciating that you are greater than anything in our lives, good, bad, or indifferent. And we honor you in Jesus' name.